comes to being thankful and it comes to miracles, the first thing that you need to decide for yourself is do you believe in miracles? There are a lot of people that say, well, I just don't believe that miracles happen anymore. You've heard Pastor Hagee say this many times. You will believe in miracles when you need one. But before we begin to discuss how thanksgiving is connected to God's miracle working power, you need to decide first if you believe in miracles. Because you have to have faith in the God who does miracles in order to receive one. People say, well, I just don't know that miracles happen anymore. You need to know that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he was, and he is, and he always will be a miracle-working God. He is mighty to save. He is able to deliver. He is an awesome God, and he does not change. But when it comes to his miracle-working power, you are the one who decides whether you receive a miracle or not. And the way that you make this choice is by your willingness to be thankful. Before we connect thanksgiving and a miracle, we need to define what is a miracle. Because there are a lot of people who will use the word miracle to describe an event that has nothing to do with the supernatural, it has nothing to do with the miraculous, and yet they delude the value of miracles whenever they say, oh, it's a miracle. Consider a moment in sports history. 1980, the United States Olympic hockey team is playing the professionally paid USSR hockey team. As the skaters hit the ice, everybody believes that the USSR is going to demolish the United States amateurs. But as the game goes on, the United States is in the game. And as it comes to a conclusion and time is getting ready to expire, it appears that the United States is going to do the unimaginable and they're going to win the game. And Al Michaels, the renowned sports announcer, just as time runs out, what does he say? He says, do you believe in miracles? He sounded like a charismatic for a moment. (laughs) They even made a movie about it. What did they call the movie? Miracle. And it's a good word, but it's the wrong word to use to describe that win. Was it a great moment in sports history? Yes, but it wasn't a miracle. Was it a phenomenal achievement for the team and those young men? Absolutely, but it wasn't a miracle. Was it a moment in national pride in which we could proudly wave our flag and we could proudly chant together, USA, USA? Absolutely, but it wasn't a miracle. Let me tell you something while we're talking about it. There is nothing wrong by being proud of and thankful for the nation that you live in. This hockey game, it was improbable that we would win. The odds were stacked against the United States. And even though it seemed unlikely, there was a chance that it could happen. And so what you saw in that moment in time was no miracle. It was just a maximum effort by one group of young men to do what nobody thought they could. It was wonderful, but it wasn't a miracle. Greatest miracle that you will ever see is salvation. People go to services where they promise miracles. You know, whenever a dead man gets up and walks, we down here on earth will shout. You know what the angels do? We've seen that before. He's going to die again. It's the only way to get up here. When five loaves become 5,000, we drop our jaws and wonder, how did they do that? Angels go, old hat. Wait till you get up here. Marriage supper of the Lamb's going to be off the chain. (laughs) But do you know what all of heaven considers the greatest miracle to be? When one sinner 
professes Jesus Christ, the Bible says every angel in heaven stops and takes a praise break because heaven has now seen something that is miraculous, that those who were not worthy have been made worthy, that those who were away from God have been brought back to God, that those who were in need of a Savior have found one. We are told rejoice in the joy of our salvation, and yet we use that salvation as something to support subordinate to everything else. The truth is, if all we ever did was get saved and set free, God has done enough and he deserves to get the highest praise and the highest glory for giving us salvation through Jesus Christ. Child of God, give him a hand clap of praise that he's worthy of in this place. Every day you wake up, you should be thankful. You say, for what? That you're still saved. Because I don't know about you, but I have a hard time living perfect days. I mean, there's some days I do better than others, but I can't ever say I can write one down in the old prayer journal. I was perfect today. And the reason is, is because when I read the Bible, there's this thing about every thought, every word, every deed. And there's a lot of days where I don't have any problem with the deeds thing. But then there's some days that I have a problem with the words thing. My deeds are pretty good, but I lost it in the words. You ever been there? Don't don't, don't let the preacher just testify by himself. I mean, you're turning off a 1604 onto I-10 and the sign says, bridge closed. (laughs) Words are a challenge. (laughs) Sometimes you run out of things to say. (laughs) And there are days where the deeds and the words are good, but then he threw in thoughts. Whew. I mean, I think I'm exhibiting a great amount of self-control when I don't say it, but he said, don't even think it. I went... Have you ever heard a computer trying to open too many files at once? <laughs> if my mouth ever quits moving, that's what my brain is doing. <laughs> it's like reboot. Just shut it off, start over. No, I've never lived a perfect day, but I thank God because every day I'm still saved. I didn't deserve salvation when I received it, and I still don't deserve it, but his mercy is renewed every morning. I believe what Paul said. I know in whom I have believed, and I believe that he is able. Able to do what? Able to keep me saved. Able to keep me on my way to heaven. Able to keep me in his hands of grace and mercy. Able to allow his loving kindness to follow me even though I don't deserve it. His favor to be upon me even though I've done nothing to earn it. All of the promises of God are alive in me, not because I have earned them, but because through his grace and his mercy and his love divine he has given them therefore church today I am thankful give the Lord a hand clap of praise so you need to understand that thanksgiving is the key to miracles if you're not thankful you disqualify yourself from receiving a miracle And I'll prove this in the Word of God. In this series, I wanted to establish that thanksgiving is not a spiritual suggestion. It's a Bible command. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. That's what the Bible says. Paul told the church in Colossians 3 and 15, he said, Let the peace of God rule your heart and mind and be thankful. He echoed this to the church in Thessalonica. In everything, give thanks. To the church in Ephesus, he said, Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, giving thanks always. Say that with me. Giving thanks always. The church in Ephesus was being persecuted by Rome and sacrificed to lions. Giving thanks always. Always. 
Could you imagine going to church whenever the preacher got up? He said, tonight for dinner on the grounds, it's you. And Paul writes, give thanks always. Why? To God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So the Bible commands us to be thankful. The book of James says this, to him who knows to do right and does it not, to him it is sin. So if the Bible tells us to be thankful and we know we're supposed to be thankful, when we're unthankful, we live in sin. Unthankful people do not get their prayers heard in heaven. You can pray on earth and the roof is like rubber. Your words hit the ceiling and just bounce right back on your head. Why? Because the Bible says, enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving. And into his courts with what? Praise. Philippians 4 and 6, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God is telling you that thanksgiving is the key that unlocks the door. If you come to my house and you don't have the right key, you are going to stop at the door. You can try and put the key into the keyhole. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. If it doesn't, good luck. You can stay there till somebody opens the door. If it fits, but it's not the right key, you can twist it, you can turn it, you can bend it, you can break it, but you're not getting through the door. Do you know why? You've got the wrong key. When the Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, God is saying, this is the key. It doesn't say complain for five minutes and then say, but Lord, you know I'm thankful. It says you start out being thankful and suddenly you have put the key into the door that opens up my gates and brings you into my courts. And when you get in my courts, go from thanksgiving into praise. This is the key that puts you in the presence of God where miracles happen. The Beatitudes are the essence of Jesus' teachings a code of conduct for Christianity, sacred truths from the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. In a society that exalts personal gain, the Beatitudes offer a message of happiness and service, urging us to be merciful bearers of God's compassion to the world. For your gift of any amount, we will send you a beautiful olive wood ornament celebrating 75 years of Israeli statehood. For your gift of $200 or more, you'll also receive the Stairway to the Stars sermon series and a Jerusalem stone tile inscribed with the Shema, a foundational prayer of Judaism that has been prayed in Israel for thousands of years. Allow the lessons in the Beatitudes to guide your life and discover God's divine path for your future. Send your best gift today. Call the number on your screen or go to jhm.org slash blessed. When you start a conversation with God, start by being thankful. Start by listing all of the wonderful things that God has given you, like the breath that you breathe. Because it is He who has made us and not we ourselves. Start off by reminding yourself and telling Him, God, I recognize that you are the potter and I am the clay. I recognize and I'm thankful that you're the master and I'm the servant. You are all-knowing. You know what I don't. You are all-powerful. You can do what I can't. You are omnipotent. You are everywhere all of the time. And right here, right now, I'm thankful because you are the one who sits upon the throne and you're watching over me. You start talking to God like that and suddenly he makes you his top priority. And this is when miracles happen. It begins when you come to the realization you are not in control. I'm going to liberate some folks in here. I'm going to give you permission to do something you've wanted to do forever. You can look at anybody you want to right now and say, you are not in control. <laughs> Go ahead. Some of y'all are like, no, 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 no. 
I mean, even some of the sour faces kind of smirked. They're like, you might not have said it, but you know who you wanted to talk to. And the truth is, none of us are in control. God is the only one who all the time in every situation has been in total control. You have to recognize that you're not in control. And the second you do, it liberates you because the moment that you are free from understanding that you are not in control, you have the opportunity to get to know the person who is. When you think you're in control, you look at everything that's happening as if it's your fault. When you recognize you're not in control, you want to get to know who's calling the shots. And the more you get to know the person in control, the more you are favored. Thanksgiving is the key to releasing God's power in your life. Go look at the account in Luke, the ninth chapter of the fishes and the loaves. When Jesus received the fishes and the loaves, the disciples said, this is all we have, but what are these in front of so many? They were saying, ours is not enough. How did God take not enough and make it more than enough? The Bible says that he took it in his hands and he said, Father, I thank you. When he had given thanks for what he had, what he had went from not enough to more than enough. How do you treat your lack? How many times in our life do we take not enough and rather than take it and say, God, I thank you, we take our not enough and we say, if I only had a little more of this or if I only had a little more of that or I don't understand why everybody else has more than they need and I don't have enough of what I need. Oftentimes we take our lack and we use it as a source for complaint. But if you'll flip that, if you'll take what you don't have and you'll take what you do have and say, God, I thank you for what is here. Watch God bless it and break it and multiply it until your not enough becomes more than enough because the God that we serve is an all-sufficient God and he can do more than you could ask, think, or imagine. When Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, what did he do? He told them to roll the stone away. And when the stone rolled away, he looked up to heaven and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And it was the thanksgiving that Jesus offered the Father in heaven that made a dead man walk out of his grave. If you're standing in front of an impossible situation and you don't see how anything good can come out of this, if you're struggling to see how God's plan can be fulfilled when you've done all that you can and it still wasn't enough, don't worry about what you've been through. Don't worry about what they're saying about you. Don't worry about what the bystanders think. Do what Jesus did. Look to heaven and say, Father, I thank you. I thank you for the trial that I'm going through. I don't understand the trial but I know you're with me in the trial. I know you're teaching me to follow you. I know that you're teaching me to trust in you. I thank you that right now I don't have enough, but I'm talking to a God who is more than enough. I thank you that you can do what I can't. I thank you that you know what I don't. I thank you that nothing is impossible with you. Lord, I thank you for my business. It may not be going in the right direction, but I promise that when I give it to you, you're going to multiply it and you're going to increase it. I thank you that what you have in store for my tomorrow is far better than anything I've ever known today. God, I thank you for my season of a broken heart. I thank you for the dark valley that I'm walking through. I thank you for the burden that you've placed upon my shoulders because today I give it to you. You're in control. I thank you because you'll mend my heart and I'll be stronger than before. I thank you because in this dark valley You're still the light of the world. I thank you for this present burden, for these light afflictions are not worthy to be compared with what you have in store for me when I get to the other side. But God, I thank you. Thanksgiving brings a double blessing. Thanksgiving not only brings a miracle, but Thanksgiving brings salvation. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Jesus is walking by a field of lepers. And leprosy was something that cost you everything. 
If you were diagnosed with leprosy, you couldn't live in your house because you would infect the family. You couldn't live in town because the town would be quarantined. You couldn't go to the temple because you weren't allowed to be in there with that infirmity. It was the thing that cost you everything. So when Jesus walks by these ten lepers, they're living in a leper's colony. And being the miraculous, powerful son of God that he is, he walks by and he sees ten of them and he says, you are made whole, go present yourself to the priest. Now they had to go see the priest because the priest was the one who diagnosed them and the priest was the one who sent them to the leper's colony and the priest was the only one who could put them back into society. And it never happened. Because when you got leprosy, you were done. Here's ten men, ten fathers, ten husbands, ten neighbors, ten builders, ten buyers, ten people in the community sitting together talking about where they'd rather be anywhere but here. And suddenly Jesus walks by and says, you're, you're made whole, go present yourself to the priest. All ten of them get up and take off running to the priest. They're shouting for joy. They're thrilled because they've received what they never thought they could have. They're saying, tonight, I'll sleep in my own bed. Tonight, I'll eat dinner with my family around my table. Tomorrow, I get to go back to work. On Sunday, I'm going back to church because I've been made whole. All ten of them got the healing. But one of them, he stopped. He said, before I go get this blessing, I need to turn around and say thank you. I need to turn around and say thank you. And when he gets to Jesus and he says, thank you, he falls at his feet and he worships him. Thank you. Thank you that you've saved my life. Thank you that you've given me everything that I lost back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus appreciated the praise, but listen to what Jesus says. He says, were there not ten? Where are the other nine? Sometimes I think we make Jesus too quiet. Were there not ten? Where are the other nine? No. I can hear his heartbreak. Where's the rest of them? I set them all free. How come this is the only one who comes back to thank me? Church, how many Sundays do we all get a blessing? How many Sundays has he given us what we don't deserve? How many Sundays has he poured out something on thousands and only 10% come to say thank you and 90% just walk out blessed? What would happen if 100% said, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving me everything that the enemy took away from me. Thank you for my salvation and my forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy and thank you for your grace and thank you for my family and thank you for my health and thank you for my provision and thank you for my protection and thank you for the peace of God that surpasses all understanding and thank you that you're my joy and that you're my strength and that you're my hope and that you're my peace and that you are my burden bearer. Thank you that you're a strong tower that the righteous run into and are saved. Thank you Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. What would happen if we all decided to just take a moment and be thankful unto Him and bless His name? Oh, church, would you stand with me? Would you thank the Lord for His goodness? Would you lift your voice and give Him a shout of triumph in this place? Right where you are, I just want you to lift your hands and I want you to open your mouth and just start thanking him. Father, we ask your forgiveness today. 
because we've murmured about the minor instead of being thankful for the major. We've complained about the schedule instead of thanking you for our purpose. We've complained about the work instead of thanking you for the provision. We've complained about the weather instead of thanking you for the day that you have made. Lord, today we are thankful. In all seasons, we're thankful. In every moment where we breathe, we're thankful. In every day, we're thankful. Because you and you alone are worthy, worthy, worthy of highest praise. Today in this place, Lord, there are some who are facing impossible situations. Rather than consider what cannot be done, they're just going to lift their hands and thank you. They're going to thank you for bringing that broken family back together. They're going to thank you for healing a physical body that doctors said can't be touched. They're going to thank you for bringing that wayward child back from the far country. They're going to thank you for opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out financial blessings upon their business. They're going to thank you for wisdom to solve the problem that they see as impossible. But today, Father, they're not going to complain about it or murmur about it. They're just going to open their mouth and thank you. There are some in this place that not enough needs to become more than enough. Lord, they thank you that you are the God who can and you are the God who will. We thank you. We believe in the power of prayer and thanksgiving. And we stand in faith with you, knowing that God answers prayer. Join us each Sunday for our live service. The program you're watching is only a portion of the message. Be blessed with the entire sermon and the worship service at jhm.org slash watch. Join us at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., and 6.30 p.m. Central Time at jhm.org slash watch. Walk in the victory that God has for you and many blessings. This is Cornerstone. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's time for the Church of Jesus Christ to stand up and to hold the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ that the world may see Him. God has made it possible for us to reach the nations of the world in every language that we can get it translated in. He is the way, the truth, and the life for all of the world. We're saving the world one life at a time. In Judaism, there's a saying, he who saves one life saves the world. Cornerstone Church is God's church. It was built for the next generation. Tens of thousands have come to know Christ, and the harvest field is greater than ever before. The latter years are going to be greater than the former years, for the best is yet to be. Honor Pastor Hagen's 65 years of ministry and go to jhm.org slash 65 years. You've been watching Hagee Ministries. If you need prayer, call our prayer line or visit our website. Be blessed and join us tomorrow.